Welcome to the Dead Celebrities Podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Dead Celebrity Podcast. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. My guest this week is David Lesperance. David is a highly respected international tax and immigration advisor with over 30 years' experience advising high and ultra-high net worth individuals and families. His interest in these areas grew from his experience working as a Canadian immigration and customs officer while studying law. David has written for or been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, The Economist, Financial Times, Mother Jones, CNBC, BBC, and several leading Asian Asian journals such as the South China Morning Post, Asia Times, and then, of course, WealthManagement.com. His blog, The Lesperance Letter, can be found at the Lesperance and Associates website, which is www.lesperanceassociates.com, and it is linked in the show notes below, the easy way to do it. The subject of our discussion this week is Yul Brynner. Brynner was a Russian-Swiss-American film and stage actor who first became widely known for his portrayal of King Mongkut of Siam in the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical The King and I, for which he won two Tony Awards, and he later added an Academy Award for the film version. He played the role a total of 4,625 times on stage. He also starred as Ramses II in the 1956 Cecil B. DeMille epic The Ten Commandments. He played General Bonine in the film Anastasia, the gunman Chris Adams in The Magnificent Seven and its first sequel, Return of the Seven, and the android in The Gunslinger in Westworld and its sequels Future World in the mid-70s, which is very, very different from the current Westworld, although cool in itself. Yul Brynner was born in July 11th, 1920 in the city of Vladivostok in the Far Eastern Republic, which was a puppet state controlled by Soviet Russia before it was merged into the wider USSR two years later. He was naturalized as a U.S. citizen after applying in 1943 at the age of 22 while living in New York as an actor and radio announcer. However, and it's here that we come to the topic we'll be addressing today, in June of 65, he renounced his U.S. citizenship at the U.S. Embassy in Switzerland for tax reasons. Now, while the immediate motive for his renunciation was primarily to sever income tax, his successful renunciation meant that when he died in October of 85, His estate was also not subject to U.S. estate tax. Now, while the laws have changed several times since Brenner's passing, the number of wealthy Americans who have been using renunciation as a method of severing their U.S. tax liability has actually been increasing dramatically to thousands annually. This group now includes other celebrities, such as Tina Turner, actor Jet Li, financiers John Templeton and Mark Mobius, and most famously, Facebook co-founder Eduardo Savarin. So, David... Let's start here with the very basics. What is it about the American tax system that's so bad as to make people renounce U.S. citizenship to escape from it? Well, thank you, David, for uh, inviting me to speak. The first thing that advisors need to understand is that the United States is pretty much unique in making citizenship a basis for taxation. All other major countries apply a residence test. They say that you're either physically present here or you have close connections and therefore you're a taxpayer. For the United States, they also include the fact that you're a citizen, even if you've never lived in the United States. So if you want to leave the U.S. tax system as opposed to leaving the Canadian or the British or the French, you have to actually renounce your citizenship, which means, practically speaking, that you have to have a second citizenship in hand. And the second thing to remember is that for a renunciation strategy, it's something that is done while the client is actually alive, although it does have major estate tax 
implications and is traditionally been done for estate tax purposes. And the third thing to remember is while the, the plan was properly executed, does sever the U.S. estate tax liability, the process needs to be meticulously planned and executed in order to realize that savings while not compromising the, the business and personal lifestyle of the client and their family members. And the final thing to remember is that while in the process we may get citizenships and residences for the client's entire family, generally speaking, only one family member needs to renounce their U.S. citizenship for the strategy to work. So thanks for that quick uh, Cliff Notes version. Obviously, um, it's far more complicated than just what we went over, but we don't have the time to really get into it as deeply as we could. David, if we said thousands are now executing this strategy annually, but the number of U.S. citizens living abroad is far larger than that, right? So why is this not more universally accepted if it's so great? Well, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. I did my first one in first U.S. expatriation in 1990. And I've come to think of really four reasons why more people are not doing this. One is just a lack of awareness of the existence of the strategy. The media compounds this misinformation. And in fact, the two academic architects of the current Sanders war and wealth tax proposals, Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Suez, actually are trying to claim that it's not possible to expatriate when, of course, thousands of people are doing it. A another reason is there's a lack of knowledge of the fact that when that people can reproduce their lifestyle outside of the United States, in large developed countries like Canada, the UK, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, but have a fraction of the total tax burden that they currently experience in the United States. A third reason is that people tend to underestimate the cumulative cost of various tax-rich proposals. My clients are not just looking at the wealth tax. They're looking at, are capital gains rates going to increase? Uh, is carried interest gone? Are the income tax rates going to increase? Is there going to be increased estate and gift taxation? What are the limits on their SALT deductions? All of these things cumulatively are taken into effect, and people realize that over their lifetime, because they are severing all their future living and estate tax liability, that it's quite a large sum. And the final thing is that they, they overestimate the cost of giving themselves the ability to, as I say, vote with their feet. So it's just uh, another basic question here. Expatriation, expatriate, that's a, kind of a scary word, right? What exactly does that mean when someone expatriates? Can the person who renounces their citizenship still visit the U.S.? Can they change their mind and get it back? Oh, absolutely. They, they can visit the United States. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's normally only one family member who actually renounces their citizenship, which is the scary part that you mentioned. As somebody who's lived his entire life without a U.S. citizenship, I can tell you that most of the world enjoys quite a nice lifestyle without having a U.S. citizenship. It's really all in the planning. And so that person can go back into the United States. There's, there's no hindrance in doing that. In fact, the problem is when they go back to the United States, it's not getting in. It's not staying too long so that they trigger the substantial presence test. And so they don't want to jump back into the 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 tax pot that they've just taken a lot of effort of, of getting out. And yes, somebody who does renounce their citizenship can decide to return back to the United States if they want to. They will generally have a number of family members who can sponsor them. And, and I've often been asked that question over the last three decades, but I've yet to actually have a client who chose once they went through the exercise to return back to the U.S. tax system. So what is the process exactly here? I mean, how expensive is it? How do you get about you know, voting with your feet, as you say? The process for wealthy Americans to acquire the ability to vote with their feet 
is what I refer to as organizing a backup plan. In short, it involves first identifying the client's family needs, preferences, timing budgets, and the cost of failure should certain tax policies come to pass. Second is determining the best means for securing a second citizenship. Third is identifying the best livable future tax home, which meets the individual or the family's business and personal needs. And the last is determining cost-efficient practical strategies to deal with the tax ramifications of leaving, which is an exit tax. It should be noted that the exit tax only applies to what are called covered expatriates. Those are people with greater than 165000 in annual tax burden over the last five years or average tax burden, or $2 million. And again, that's the group we're talking about. And so they have a deemed disposition for capital gains purposes. But they need to look at this one-time cost versus the long-term costs. And of course, if those capital gains rates increase in the future, that cost would would really be extraordinarily higher. Now, I mentioned the first step for clients is to get get themselves a second non-American citizenship. And this can be done a variety of ways. One is by having a birth citizenship. For example, Eduardo Saverin, who mentioned earlier, had a Brazilian citizenship prior to becoming naturalized in, in the United States. Second is becoming naturalized in another country, such as Canada or Australia or New Zealand. These are people who are, have, have already physically moved from the United States, spent enough time in a new country to become naturalized in that country. The third is lineage. The United States is an immigrant country. A large number of Americans have, through themselves or their spouse, entitlement to a lineage citizenship, or citizenship by descent. Another one that is quite popular is through ALIA, reacquiring Israeli citizenship. And with 30% of the Forbes 400 list having Jewish ties, that is one that it, I'm quite familiar with dealing with and one that we often, often do. And the last is citizenship by investment. It's the one that gets the most press, but it's actually the only path we look at once all the others have, have proven to be not available. And my experience, the selection of the, of the right citizenship by investment depends on a number of factors. Where are the clients going to live? Are they on the road to but have not yet succeeded in getting a naturalization citizenship? All of these things are, are to be taken into account. And just so we're clear on what we're talking about here, uh, citizenship by investment is effectively, you know, so some countries have a government program where if you invest a certain amount, you buy a certain amount of land in the country, then you know, once you pass a certain threshold, then they will award you citizenship. Correct. What they've done is they've replaced the naturalization period with some type of government fee or investment or, or land purchase. So you move, instead of going from residence and then eventually graduating to citizenship, you move right to citizenship. So, you, know, you refer to this as a backup plan, which sort of, you know, that kind of implies that it's not the main plan and that there's something, you know, people... And people have a backup plan like in case something happens, right? So, so what are the, the triggering events here that, that are going to cause people to, to fire their backup plan? Well, what people do, firstly, is they, they look at, just as they do for insurance, they look at what's the cost of an event happens? What's the cost of their wealth? What's the cost of their well-being? And they look at backup plans as really insurance policies. So the question is, what then triggers them actually using the backup plan? The acquisition of the backup plan is fairly straightforward once one calculates the cost versus the benefits. And the triggering events, I find, tend to fall into two groups. There are concerns about things with catastrophic outcomes, but unknown dates. They can be generally concerns about debts and deficits, uh, increasing costs of natural disasters, uh, entitlement programs, 
rebuilding crumbling infrastructure, future military ex- expenditures, all of which are made worse by political deadlock. Of course, geopolitical events such as the recent escalation of tensions between the United States and Iran or the United States and North Korea can also be one of these concerns with potential catastrophic outcomes, but unknown if they're going to happen. The second group are concerns about things with unknown outcomes, but with specific dates. And for high net worth Americans, the issue, the issue, is the November 2020 elections, because there's just significant uncertainty about it. On one side, you've got questions like, who will be the Democratic candidate? What will be the Democratic taxing platform? And now, clarity will only occur on that at the end of uh, July when we have the Democratic National Convention. But all the candidates, all the Democratic candidates have stated their tax policies. And there's an increasing possibility of a Democratic grand slam of POTUS, House, and Senate. So no matter who the, the Democratic candidate is, we know at a minimum there's going to be a loss of the preferential treatment of carried interest. Possibly all capital gains will be taxed at ordinary rates. There will be could be annual deemed dispositions, loss of step-up, limits on charitable contributions, significant estate tax increases, and, of course, the much-discussed wealth tax. On the other side of the uncertainty coin are events that will occur in some form or impact during 2020. These include the impeachment process, the health of the economy, the resolution of the current trade wars, and, of course, the conflicts that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's a funny thing, actually. Back in the, uh, the pre-2016 election, there was uh, a lot of people who were saying, oh, my God, if Trump wins, I'm, I'm going to leave the country. I'm going to run to Canada or you know, here I'm going to go. But, I mean, given the profile of the people who are generally actually renouncing their citizenship, uh, if Hillary had won, I think uh, more, much more people <laughs> would have renounced their citizenship realistically than uh, what we saw. Well, it was a, there was an interesting moment during the debates. During the second and third debate, the term carried interest and the discussion of carried interest was quite prominent. And I'm sure all your tax policy, tax lawyers and advisors out there all of a sudden said, oh, they're talking about something I know about. Most of the population didn't. You know, as it turned out, while there was some minor changes on carried interest, it was effectively has continued on, but the days of carried interest being taxed at capital gains versus ordinary rates, if there's a Democratic POTUS, because there's some speculation as to whether that can even be done by executive order, I think are numbered. And that's a doubling of the taxation on that part of the compensation. And that really affects real estate people, private equity venture capitalists, of which I have a large clientele. So they are very conscious of that. So, you know, I think it's helpful to think of this. You know, you, you categorize it sort of similarly to insurance, right, where we, it's in case these events happen or if these events happen and we don't know what the outcome is, those are the things where you, then you might need your plan. But, um, you know, with an insurance plan, you know, you pay into it, but there are ways that, you know, if, you know, thankfully whatever you're insuring against doesn't come to pass, there are ways for you to recoup some of that money. If you, you know, ultimately end up, you, know, you put this backup plan, as you say, in place, you do all the time and all the spending and the planning, and then you end up not using it, obviously you're not going to be able to get your money back, but, I mean, is there, are there other benefits if you, of having this plan in place, be, even if you end up not renouncing your citizenship? Oh, absolutely. In getting the backup plan, you're going to be getting second citizenships and travel documents and, and homes for the entire family. If I look at my own family. The Les Bronx children didn't set out this way, but my older sister married a Latvian. My older brother married an Italian. I married a Pole, and my uh, younger sister married an Irishman. And there, and we, we've gotten European citizenships for the entire family, including children. So I have nieces and nephews who are, have worked and studied and lived around the 
Europe because they had EU citizenships. So that's an immediate benefit. And it also, like an insurance policy, gives people kind of peace of mind. When you buy insurance, you, you don't want your house to catch on fire. You're hoping it's not catching on fire. You're not even sure that it, there's a better than 50-50 chance that it will. But you know that if the event occurs and that there's more than a remote possibility that it'll occur, that if you're not insured, you're going to suffer kind of a catastrophic failure. And one other thing, David, I wanted to mention, which is something that's really kind of become apparent in my most recent work and my most recent clients is the issue of strategic philanthropy. If you think about traditionally expatriation was done for estate tax purposes or in the case of a young person like Eduardo Saverin who had a, a number of years uh, of earning potential getting out of the U.S.'s and U.S. living taxes, strategic philanthropy is really a much bigger issue now. If you look at the, the 2020 Unified Credits, for example, for a couple, you're talking about $23 million before estate tax starts kicking in. People who are above this level, those are the really starting to get into the target range of the Sanders and Warren wealth tax proposals. And what they're seeing is, is that they, they want to maintain control over the disposal of their after-tax wealth by using strategic philanthropy, either themselves or with their heirs. And it's really what I call the anen Giriaitis versus kind of Reed Hoffman debate. In short, should the wealthy, A, pay more in taxes and trust the government to decide on priorities and implement solutions to societal ills, or B, do these individuals use their skills, contacts, and focus on determining and implementing strategic philanthropy and solving specific societal ills? And Leon Cooperman made kind of this exact point in his rebuttal to Elizabeth Warren, and it's something you actually also see from Bill Gates in, in his discussion, although in New Year's he talked about increased taxation, he has definitely shrunk away from a wealth tax or in, inhibiting on his ability to engage in strategic philanthropy. Well, David, we're just about out of time here, and so I'm going to do what I do with all my guests and put you on the spot at the end here. You know, we've talked, you know, I, I brought up before that I think the general view of expatriation is that it's a bit of an extreme option. It's a bit scary. And I think that a lot of times, you know, if I'm an advisor and I and I'm suggest this idea to my client that at first glance, like they may have a negative reaction. Their eyes may kind of bug out of their head a little bit. If there's one thing you could sort of teach people about, you know, the, the process, whether it's the utility or dispelling a myth or anything like that, like with the one thing that you think is most important for people to know to sort of like normalize it, I guess, um, what would that be? Well, when people get nervous about the situation, they have really three different possible reactions. There's a famous economist, Albert Hirschman, who said you have the reactions of exit, voice, or loyalty. So if you like the changes, you're going to engage in loyalty, you're going to join the patriotic Americans. If you don't like it, you have the choice of voice, which is you can send money to a political candidate who's going to espouse the policies that you want. But if you want to exploit or, or explore the exit option, which is what we're talking about, what I tell clients is spend the same amount of money that you're going to spend on the, the, the voice, which is for combined spousal 4,800 U.S., on really exploring and finding out and answering those questions. What is the cost of going? What is the, where can you live? Most people, when I say you could move to, to Canada, are saying, well, it's a high-tax country. Yes, it's a high-tax rate country, but you can, through legal pre-immigration tax planning, greatly reduce that, and Canada doesn't have an estate or gift tax or wealth tax regime. UK, a number of large countries... And so spend a little bit of money to educate yourself and assess so you can make a cost-benefit analysis. And then, after doing that, if that makes sense, 
get the backup plan in place. Get your so get a quote on the insurance policy if it makes sense. Get the insurance policy, and then you personally decide if and when you ever hit your own personal triggering event where you're going to trigger the insurance policy. I think that's a great point that you just brought up there. That you know, right at the end here that we hadn't really covered. I think a lot of people's idea of, you know, when they say renounce my citizenship, they think you're sort of like running off to like a channel Island or some sort of tax shelter. But I mean, by and large, we're talking about sort of actual countries you would want to live in and, and that aren't, you know, you know, that, that you know, just, just not the U S effectively. In fact, about three quarters of my clients tend to live in what are traditionally thought of as high tax countries, but on a lower controlled tax basis. And that's, for example, in the United Kingdom, there's something called the resident non-dom system. Switzerland, of course, has its famous forfait fiscal system. But there are a number of countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Italy, Greece, Portugal, that have legal either regimes or planning opportunities which allow people to vastly reduce their their annual tax burden, and their end-of-life tax burden. Well, we're all out of time. I'd like to thank uh, our guest this week, David Lesperance, for being great and really uh, cluing us in on a very interesting topic. Thank you, David. And um, you know, for, all our, for all our listeners, I'll see you guys next time, or I guess you'll hear me next time on the next episode of the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Support for today's podcast is brought to you by FS Investments. Finding income for your clients is tough. FS Investments makes it easier by designing solutions that help investors reach their income goals and secure their futures. FS Investments never settles, so advisors and investors won't have to either. Visit fsinvestments.com slash dead celebrities and discover what it means to never settle. This is not an offer to buy securities. Investors are advised to consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing.